The quote, my name is Budir Sosudarmo. Uh, I'm uh, an economist with the ANU Indonesia project. I will chair this session. Uh, we follow the previous format, uh, 30 minutes of uh, main presentation, and then about maximum 20 minutes uh, for discussion. And we will have Q&A in the last part of this session. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, two uh, prominent Indonesian economists in this session. Uh, the main speaker in the session is uh, Raden Pardede. He is currently the co-founder and the executive uh, director of Creco Research Institute. Uh, a little bit background about him. He received his uh, undergraduate in chemical engineering in Bandung Institute of Technology. And then after that, he uh, received a degree, master and PhD from Boston University. He has held several important uh, positions uh, related to the government of Indonesia. Uh, he has served as a chairman of the National Economic Committee and as a secretary general of Indonesia Financial System Stability Committee. Uh, and he has been uh, advising uh, Indonesian president uh, for a while. And our uh, second speaker is uh, Riyatu. Uh, she is currently uh, the director of LPM at the University of Indonesia. She received her bachelor degree from University of Indonesia in the Faculty of Economic and Business. And then later on, she got her master degree and PhD from Georgia State University. Uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Adan Pardede. Thank you. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure, uh, and I have to thank uh, the Indonesian project for inviting me to present the update of uh, Indonesian economy today. Uh, this is in line with my uh, survey of recent development that uh, we, me and uh, my co-author, Sirin Zahro, will uh, write in the, in the bulletin of Indonesian uh, economic survey, yeah. uh, studies of BS, uh, in the coming month. Uh, this is a very important uh, picture. I'd like to comment on this one because you have, in your left-hand side, of course, am I right? Left-hand side, it is just like uh, the picture that provided by uh, Indonesian project, but in the right hand side, I think even very important. And also, we talk about, I think, <coughs> really talk about the, the radicalism, and that's precisely in the uh, bottom of the picture here. It is, I'm taking this one from the New York Times. It's not my picture, anyway. <laughs> it's, so I don't, I, don't, I don't try to comment on this uh, picture, but you know, the picture is, tells a lot. So I need to tell about these ones. Uh, I'll start with a summary because my time is limited, whereas at the same time I prepared so many slides. So in case that I don't have time to uh, show all the slides, I will start with these ones. First of all, uh, too early to conclude Indonesia is in new normal, low 5% uh, growth. Uh, but uh, certainly the current data showing that uh, limited limited improvement compared to last year. Second, despite a stable household consumption, we observe three important points. One is the rise of online household spending, especially among uh, urban upper income group and also young populations. And uh, the second is the shifting of household spending, especially for upper income group from necessity goods to laser goods and services. And number three is the decline of purchasing power of lower income group and informal workers. The third point is basically most of the data indicate 
a weakening growth of domestic demand. Uh, I will uh, describe later on why I mentioned about these ones. And at the same time, the macro stability, which is good, and also financial stability remains intact. So we don't have any problem so far right now in terms of macroeconomic stability and financial stability. But of course, we see some continued weakening of domestic demand. As usual, when you have problem with uh, weakening demand, that you'd like to see uh, monetary, especially fiscal policy, to play a significant role. But at the same time, we see that monetary and fiscal authorities do not have much room to maneuver to stimulate the economy. Hence, uh, policymakers turn to structural or deregulation reform initiative. But of course, this is not easy. Uh, because despite good initiative from the government to accelerate deregulation and administrative reform, the effectiveness of reform far from satisfactory. And I think you can relate it, this statement to the previous uh, presentations later on. Uh, the effectiveness of reform far from satisfactory and mainly due to institutional capacity constraint. This is the outline of my presentations. Again, it is too early to conclude. This is my point number one, that 5% growth becoming a new normal for Indonesia. And a second point is basically, this, despite stable and smooth consumption, a lot of things happens below the surface. And a micro stability, again, and number four is limitation of fiscal and monetary policy. And number five, point number five is structural reform and implementations constraint in decentralized Indonesia. Let me start from these ones. Point number one, is it too early to conclude the 5% growth for Indonesia becoming a new normal? A new normal of lower growth, of course, caused by external constraint. Many uh, economists around the world now talking about the uh, uh, secular stagnations. At the same time, we see some increasing protectionism, nationalism, populism, depopulation or aging populations, and uh, deleveraging in global economy. Whereas internal constraint that we face right now, which is institutional capacity challenge. And just like what we see a constraint in the global economy, nationalism, populism, protectionism, and problem in the labor market. Is, is it still possible for Indonesia to achieve 7% growth? Because any leaders, I mean, starting from uh, Megawati, and then Yudhoyono, and then currently, of course, uh, Jokowi, always promise at least 7%. But at the same time, even during the SBY government, with commodity boom supporting, <coughs> Indonesia falls short of 7%. At most, that Indonesia achieved at the time is 6.5%. That one is during the commodity boom. At the same time, is it this new lower growth sustainable enough? Because at the same time, a new young population is coming to the labor market. At the same time, we face some problem in terms of a distribution of income. So many people are still left behind. And again, is it 5% is enough for Indonesia? But I have to put some note in the red note there. Comparison to many countries, 5% growth is not bad at all anyway. Just as a <laughs> but let me uh, give you some background here. This is a global trend. I just taken this one from IMF report. The growth trend is entering a new normal. They call it a new normal, both in advanced and emerging economies. Of course, the orange line there, it is 
the emerging economies, whereas the blue line, it is advanced economies. And the average, and the, the, the average I think, is in the gray line there. So both emerging economies and advanced economy trending down. And similarly, Indonesia also faced the same trend. And uh, I think a lot of things happen right now in Indonesia. Indonesia GDP growth trend is declining. Look at the period. I intentionally making the period here. The, the before uh, Indonesian financial crisis, since 1966, Indonesia on average grow by 6.5%. Whereas after financial crisis, of course, I just taken out the financial crisis, which is deep. Uh, now, even during the commodity boom, we only have 5.34% on average. And recently, it's 5.1%. But look at the bottom here. A long-term trend that we saw all the component of the GDP, consumption down. I can show the, uh, the picture later on. And investment even trending down deeper. And government consumption also trending down. And also, of course, net export, which is uh, export minus uh, import also trending down. So all the domestic demand component is going down. Of course, the current uh, data, which is the, 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 the first half of this year, we see some consumptions continue stagnant, whereas investment increased, but still far below our uh, previous performance. And government continue to fall, and again, uh, net export rise a bit. So if we come up with the, uh, this picture, is clearly say that effective demand problem facing by Indonesia right now, which is investment plus government consumption plus uh, private consumption is domestic demand, is going down. In the long term, of course, the growth of domestic demand is going down as well. In the short term, government investment, government consumption, as we see here later on, is still quite OK. At the same time, we see some changing, which is the growth of investment which is we have it in the past, much higher than the growth of consumption, now the pattern is changing, which is the growth of consumption much, uh, I could say, higher than growth of investment. So there is a shifting from investment-driven growth to consumption-driven growth now in Indonesia. At the same time, I can show you later on, there is also a change in the pattern of growth from manufacturing driven growth to service driven growth. Again, is Indonesia is too early to go to that direction or not? Is it sustainable or not? That's actually the valid questions that Indonesia has to address right now. This is just to show you uh, to support my argument here. This is a household consumption. Look at there. So the household consumption on average uh, before the financial crisis is only 6.5%, right? And uh, investment, 12%. It's totally different. But now looking, look at the, the, the right-hand side, of course. Consumption, it is declined a bit after the global finance, after the uh, Asian financial crisis, but now increase a bit to become 5.1%. Uh, Whereas at the same time, 
Look at the pattern of uh, uh, investment. Investment continued to go down, and even during the commodity boom, it grows by 8.2%, and now it's only 4.7%. I think this is very interesting phenomena that uh, all of us, especially the economists in Indonesia, have to address this one for us. And investment growth, again, this one's long-term trend of investment is falling, while uh, incremental capital output ratio is rising, indicating lower productive investment. I, I just try, at the same time, of course, uh, the, we see some deteriorations of uh, confidence on optimism, especially among business communities, business communities recently. With maybe one of the reasons why may postpone their investment, which is later on I can show you basically the demand for credit is also slowing down, and also their spending also slowing down, especially uh, for luxury goods. One of the reasons it is because of political uncertainty. Uh, the rise, I think uh, Fedi already described these ones. The rise of perceived Islam radicalism starting since Jakarta governor elections. We see that basically the confidence is kind of shifting down quite substantially after this one. I think this is quite, uh, quite distinct, especially in the urban area. Second, the aggressive tax revenue target. Of course, the government would like to stimulate the economy, like to collect more money to stimulate the economy. But at the same time, we see some negative side effect of this ones because the tax officer and custom officer to take more aggressive approach toward taxpayers. Number three is uh, uncertainty of contract. It's particularly that uh, I think we see in oil, gas, energy, and mining sector. Number four, this is the recent development, uh, government intervention in the marketplace, including the price cap of premium rice, which is, uh, is quite, uh, is quite uh, for us, uh, we don't understand why this policy has to come out. <laughs> because the rice itself, I mean, it is a competitive market. And yet you try to have a price cap. And, and the, the consumer of this premium rice, it is the upper income group. So why you should bother with the upper? Because they can afford to buy at any price anyway. So, but then this comes. Uh, this policy is, is really re remarkable. And uh, number five is the dominant role of the state on enterprise. Now many uh, private contractors in infrastructure in Indonesia is complaining about this because most of the infrastructure project is awarding to the state on enterprise. Again, I just show you the government consumption also going down. This is a similar trend. All the component of the domestic demand actually going down. Again, uh, this is a positive one, of course, despite lower government consumptions, infrastructure spending is rising. Look at the number there. It's almost three-four compared to the uh, previous government. Um, I don't have any problem with the previous government, just to show the numbers there <laughs> in terms of infrastructure spending. And again, export performance. Uh, and I'd like to kind of sit a bit about this one. This is, in my view, is very important because a lot of things happen uh, despite recently we see some uh, smooth in the consumption. Uh, I don't have time to explain a lot of these ones, but I just show you the picture here, the number here. Anyway, the first uh, in, in your left hand side, it is. Uh, Old Mall in Jabodetabek, it is in, in Jakarta uh, Metropolitan is basically. The Old Mall is left. Look at the, the sales performance in 2016 and uh, first half of 2017. It's 
is dropped dramatically. And at the same time, the convenient shopping mall, this is a modern mall, this Gandaria Casablanca, it is again in Jabodetabek, is a Jakarta metropolitan area, is increasing rapidly. And at the same time, if you look at in the left, uh, the, the, the last uh, graph there, then even more interesting in my view, one is look at the rise of the mini market. So mini market even replaced the hypermarket. Yeah, the hypermarket, the uh, green one. And then of course, they also, uh, if you see the, the decline of the tra traditional store. I'd like to make a, an important remark here because, you know, the job creations in this traditional and old mall, I think, destroy. At the same time, I don't know whether the existing worker that used to work in these traditional old malls also can work or shifting to the modern mall on mini market. And uh, I suspect this is one of the, uh, the challenge for Indonesia as well. I give you another important uh, development in Indonesia right now. Uh, we just taken decisions from BCA. BCA is uh, the largest uh, domestic bank, transaction banks in Indonesia. Uh, we don't have the numbers in the BPS yet, but this is just to show you an early indication of what's going on in the Indonesia market. Look at there. So the blue one, is the blue there, is basically uh, the online store average collections. Yeah? And then the orange is the online. The one is the offline, it's the blue one. And the orange line there is uh, online average collections. This is, we do it monthly collections, is basically. You know, the online uh, store, which is the e-commerce, Four, four years ago is simply nothing in our banks, in, in BCA banks. But then now, look at the, it's already 20%. So you see a significant uh, rise of the e-commerce. And the second uh, picture there, it is, you see um, Tokopedia, and then uh, Sopi, Lazada, yeah? yeah. Tokopedia is now is owned by, uh, and Lazada owned by Alibaba. And Sopi, of course, owned by Tencent. And similarly, in the right-hand side is uh, Bukalapa, now is owned by uh, Tencent. There is a fierce battle in Indonesia now between these two giants, this between Alibaba and uh, Tencent on our e-commerce. They fight fiercely, and they throw a lot of money. Uh, at the same time, uh, they control all the informations, the vertical informations from customer to the store to the business. And later on, they will enter the payment system. But after that, if you have a lot of data there, big data, at the end, I think they may enter even the banking sector, the credit sector right now. And soon, probably, Amazon will come to Indonesia as well because they like Indonesia because of the big population, which is very important for this kind of uh, uh, corporate. What I'm afraid is basically on this one, uh, Indonesia have not yet, I mean, our, our regulators have not yet realized these ones. And certainly, like banking sector in Indonesia is left behind because it is highly regulated sector. So we cannot compete with them because the Alibaba and Tencent come to Indonesia with 
uh, say that they are a technology corporations. And I think this is not only the problem for Indonesia, but even for many other countries, including US. And uh, let me go to the number, uh, point number three. It's macroeconomic and financial stability intact. Uh, of course, balance of payment is strong, uh, current account deficit is lower, and trade surplus, and we see a continuing uh, flows of capital, and reserve accumulations, foreign reserve accumulation is rising now, 128 billions, and stable currency. This is the most stable uh, environment that we have over the last year, basically. And uh, the interest rate, the government bond yield also de in, on the declining trend, but still attractive. And at the same time, based on the FSAP recently, the FSAP is basically financial sector assessment programs. It's independent evaluate. <coughs> evaluators uh, make some report on Indonesian uh, financing, financial system. And uh, what they say is basically our financial system is solid right now uh, because of the time limit. I, I, I don't have time to discuss all of these ones, but let me uh, jump to these ones. Inflation in the long term in a decreasing trend and continue to decreasing. And similarly, if you just look in the short term, which is in the, in the right hand side over there, which is the uh, orange line, continue to decline, and uh, core inflation also decline. This is my concern as well, whether these lower inflations clearly signal the weakening of demand. And the weakening of demand, as I already explained to you, is already starting over the last decade and continue. And if these inflations continue to going down, could be signal something. Could be signal basically, I'm afraid because if that's continue to happen, then inflation continue to going down at the same time demand is weakening. That could, could be a sign of downward spiral. I think all of us economists is really afraid of downward spiral. Yeah. And uh, this is very important. That's why it is important to have, I mean, as usual, uh, again, this is just to show you again, now our interest rate, it is the lowest in our history. And yet our credit growth also the lowest in our history. So look at all this number is really, for me, is really uh, scary, yeah? Uh, we have to do something about this. Uh, so, where we are so far? Indonesia long-term trending growth following global uh, uh, trend, and then there is a concern about the current weak demand, and even you see the, 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 the long-term trend of the demand also weakening as well, and could be uh, becoming a downward spiral. That's what I'm afraid. So, as usual, the economists say, we need policy to step off this potential downward. This is, uh, we have uh, three main policies. Uh, Peter talked to me about this, and just use the arrows of Abesan as, as an example. You know, three arrows of Abesan, yeah, right? And monetary policy, fiscal policy, and structural policy. For some reason, I will describe later a bit this. The first two arrows has some limitation to stimulate the economy over the next two to three years. Uh, so the monetary has a limited room to maneuver right now because they already cut the benchmark rate and the lending rate also is already going down and yet the credit demand remains weak. At the same time, considering the external factors which is the Fed might start to shrinking the balance sheet and also they might rise another 25 basis point, whether this year and next year could be 50 basis point. I could say the central bank of Indonesia room to maneuver, I think is 
very small. At the same time, I don't believe that uh, the central bank can uh, stimulate our uh, demand using the monetary policy. Ah, this is just the numbers. Again, similarly, fiscal policy right now, it is difficult. There's not much room to stimulate the economy. Again, uh, constrained by uh, limited revenue collections. Uh, tax revenue uh, re relatively small. At the same time, fiscal stimulus constrained by, again, limited tax revenue. Even when I saw the numbers in our budget 2018, even in 2018, we see some fiscal limitation as well. Except probably we need to have a more better quality in the spending side of the government. Now let me start with my last point. The last point, I think, is, is, is one of the special topic of this survey, which is the, the structural policy and implementation constraint in the era of decentralized Indonesia. The main purpose of this uh, initiative is basically to create a more conducive investment and business environment. We do make survey on these ones, and when you talk to uh, business communities, they will say it's a good initiative, but implementation is lagging. And uh, this is that I will discuss uh, quite deeply in this moment is basically, and mostly due to the institutional constraint which is regional, regional bureaucracy, regional leaders, and the central government bureaucracy, and lack of coordination across institutions. I just, I, I don't want to explain these things because too many packages. <laughs> what I'm saying is, why you have too many packages? Even two, three packages are already difficult to, to implement. I, mean, I talked to one of the uh, a previous leader, uh, Buriono, and then he say, 16 packages. Even during the new order, when he was a minister, of, a minister at the time, two, three packages is already difficult to implement. Here, 16 packages, that's uh, uh, too much, too many. And this is the, the result of our survey, yeah? I, I do make survey uh, three weeks ago to all the leaders of the business community across Indonesia especially uh, leaders of Chamber of Commerce. And uh, they say it is a good initiative. But then when you're asking whether this is effective or not, they say it's not effective. And the challenge is the main problem is the bureaucracy in the central government, bureaucracy in the regional government, and uh, regional leaders. Uh, then I'll try to explain why is that. And uh, I'd like to have, uh, make a, 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 a small discussion last night with Edward Espinal about reasons. And uh, it'll be very good if you can help me to understand reasons, because this is related to the decentralized, and you are an expert in decentralized, uh, decentralization, of course. Yeah. One is, I think this is because of the institutional constraint. Number one is the bureaucracy and lack of coordination. I try to compare between the new order uh, coordinations with the current uh, coordinations. Clearly, in the previous uh, regime, previous regime, not SBY, but the, before the crisis, I like, try to avoid the name here <laughs> uh, because it is very sensitive. You know. <laughs> But basically, we have one vision, even 25 years visions at a time. And we have five year plan and program. And we have a very clear command, top down approach, coherent objective, and good coordination. And of course, very clear incentive mechanism between principal and agent over here. 
if you don't implement, you have a consequence. Yeah? Very clear. And uh, a sustainable policy across time, even if, even if the minister is changing, even if the governor is changing, but the policy is, is sustainable, continue. Now, of course, it's totally different. The main difference, each of these leaders have their own visions, have their own program, have their own plan, have their own promise to their constituents. The president promised something, and the governor promised something, and the other governor promised differently, and similarly, the Bu Party also the same thing. This is, I think, one of the problems for us. We'd like to have a democracy, like to have, I mean, delegation of power to the local government. But now, even among the people asking if the democracy is good, but if the effectiveness of the government constraint, I think this is one of the reasons why many Indonesians now complain about democracy itself. And that's clearly one of the explanations here. Clearly, there is no clear incentive mechanism. There is no clear hierarchy right now in Indonesia. So it is difficult to implement national policy if you have to go through the bureaucracy up to the lower level in Indonesia. That's the reality that probably Indonesia has to face right now. And uh, this is very complicated, of course, but let me explain this one. Get, give me another five minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, can, I, can, I can swap the trade with Riyadh, right? OK, he's already agreeing. So that's, that's a way. <laughs> Within the minister, the coordination working well. This is uh, Kati Basri and Mari Pangostu, I think is very uh, understandable reason. Because I taking these ones from the office of the president in 2011, based on uh, their analysis. Basically, within the minister, it is working well. The minister with Echelon 1, with Echelon 2, they can work together. But then when they start to work with different ministers, we see some difficulty starting. And then with different coordinating ministers, the coordination become even tougher. But look at here the red one. When you try to coordinate with the region, with the subnational government, they mention this is a deadlock. I think this is our homework. This is why our national policy is really difficult to implement to the local government right now. And challenge number two, this is very complicated. Have you read this one? Oh, the green one, it is the coalitions in the presidential elections, right? Uh, for example, the first line there, the PDIP with PKB, PDIP with PKB here, it is in, in one, one coalition. That's why it become green. And then Nasdem with PDIP, look at that, Hanura with PDIP. But then these guys, PDIP, can work together with Golkar in Dekai and Sumbar. <laughs> and uh, uh, Sum Sumbar, right? Sumbar is West Sumatra. And similarly, Gerindra and PDIP and work together to support the governor candidate in Jambi. So look at this, and it's no clear pattern of coalitions. I think it's become very difficult for us. Too many objectives at the same time. Too many parties, probably. I can give you a, a probably this is better to you. Uh, this is a Prabowo coalition in the left-hand side. That one is a Jokowi coalition. And look at that. They can work together. They don't, they don't really bother whether they support president at the same time, and then they change 
their coalitions in a different way when they support a different uh, governor. I have the number for Bupatis. You can, you can imagine Bupatis 530. And this is very complicated as well. This is just for a governorship. What I'm saying here, this is clearly the problem as well. I'm not a political scientist, but I just saw that it's really difficult for us to implement the policy in these kind of situations. My time is limited, but this is a very important one as well. <laughs> I think you like this number. This is our uh, simulation, is basically. A very expensive political financing and a rampant corruption across local government. Anyway, I interview some of the uh, local government leaders and also the political party leaders, which is if you talk openly like this one in front of them, of course, they don't, they don't tell you the truth. But if you ask one by one, it's a different way. And uh, this is precisely, I try to make this number from them, is basically. Uh, I don't know, I don't, because you, you look at first thing first is basically the number of, the total number of candidates is rising significantly. And somehow because of one is the expansions of uh, regions. You know, uh, the number of Bupatis and head of the district is increasing significantly after the, the new, after the, the, the democracy and the decentralizations. And second is the number of parties from three to 12. So the number of candidates also increasing rapidly. Of course, during Suharto, <laughs> we have a centralized corruptions. Now we have decentralized corruptions. That's the main difference. And the number of participants increasing rapidly. And that's become common. Everybody understands each other. I think this is one of the, another problem for Indonesia. In terms of number, I put the number here, 200 trillions. This is over the of five year. 200 trillion rupiah is similar to 4 billion Australian dollar. But in terms of GDP, it's only 0.3% of GDP, Indonesian GDP. So the number looks big, but not so big, basically. Why is that? Because uh, yesterday I saw the report from the World Bank. Uh, you know, the, the, the cost of macet in Indonesia, <laughs> yeah? in Jabodetabek, it's just in the Jakarta metropolitan. The, the cost of uh, heavy traffic, according to them, is 37 trillion. So look at the numbers. 40 trillion is not so much different. <laughs> at the same time, during uh, Khatib Bas' time as a Ministry of Finance, I know that he spent for what is the cash transfer to the people? I think it's around 12 trillion. If you combine 12 trillion and only two months, right? Two months or three months? Three months. If you multiply by four, one year, it's about the same, right? And could be the impact quite good for the local communities there. It's very cynical, yeah? But again, this has become very expensive. Of course, a simple one to look at this one, because of this expensive political financing from the candidate point of view. And uh, they will maximize their own utility first before the utility of the public. Uh, and this is the trust. I mean, every day we look at that. I mean, the corruption cases again, agency continue to rise. Uh, Despite we have KPK, right? At the same time, the public trust toward political party, House of Representatives, regional representative is the lowest. Let me uh, give my final remark. You already continue to. Uh, without making some effort to address this problem, and like what we have discussed, and making change in the incentive mechanism and uh, policy making approach could be differently in this new dis uh, decentralized 
Indonesia, then implementation, implementation of any national structure policy that initiated by the president may remain less effective, despite who are the president, because the system itself is really uh, in, in constraint. In Indonesia cases, the first row, the first arrow, which is the monetary policy, has been able to maintain our macroeconomic stability, while the second arrow has done its job in the last two years. But it seems to me that it's constrained over the next two to three years. The third arrow, which is the structural policy, which is always difficult to implement in any regime, facing even more constraint in the democratic and the decentralized regime. I hope it benefits all of you, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, friend and colleague, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Riyatu Kiptia, uh, director of LPM, University of Indonesia. Please. Uh, thank you, Pak Budi. Thank you, Pak Raden. Uh, actually, it's interesting to hear uh, Pak Raden presentations. I thought that, okay, wrap up until uh, uh, for the comments. Uh, so, uh, for the comment for Pak Raden, they talk about, uh, he talks about also what is the benefit of decentralization? Uh, my area is on public finances, especially on decentralization. Uh, Paradin has more of pessimistic view of decentralization. I still, I am still a believer of, of it. So yes, it is a mixed result, but I think we cannot go back to uh, the previous. Uh, you cannot name the regime. <laughs> Uh, so that's, uh, I think, the point. Uh, discussion on uh, economic growth, I will uh, directly to the conclusion. So when Pak Budi stopped me, I already got to the conclusion. <laughs> uh, actually, about the monetary fiscal policy and uh, structural uh, reform policy, uh, the case is, I think, the most promising uh, now is on uh, fiscal policy. Uh, not because I'm, I came from public finance, but maybe the monetary policy has a uh, result. Uh, uh, it may not really need it currently. Uh, the financial stability, uh, macro stability, and uh, when you think about the effectiveness of government policy, we talk about two things, about fiscal policy and structural policy. We talk about long term, especially on structural policy. So here is uh, the structural reform is the main objective is on business climate, but we have uh, we heard from discussion as well and maybe from previous survey too many initiatives. And uh, if the objective on business climate, they, they are already standard uh, comparison to other countries as well. And we, cannot, we can just following up that criteria. And uh, the case is on tackling corruptions. Uh, this is the Latin problem of Indonesia and is hampering also uh, uh, the development. And uh, in this case, it should be focusing more to existing policy not creating one, correcting the incentive of the existing policy. And this is also assuming uncertain politics. Given the uncertain politics, not much of reform that we cannot do or we cannot deliver, too many uh, parties, uh, agency involved here. So coordination, forget about coordination, give the area of interest in each party, in each champion of party, so they, uh, they, are, they are not messing up uh, the other. That's why I come from decentralization. It's about discretion, it's about decentralized institution, and when we talk about uh, politics, decoupling the issue at national, also at the local. So if there is a problem at the local, we can get a better policy at the national 
at the central level. If there is a problem at the central level, we can get at least piloting uh, some of the regions still performing well. Indonesia has that advantage, and we cannot uh, go back to actually erase that advantage by changing the institution. So, uh, we have to treat the institution as given and working by that institution. Do not give up on decentralization experiment in Indonesia. That's my message. <laughs> So, on the uh, economic growth, I'm not a uh, microeconomist, so I'm not concerned when it is 5%, 5.2, 5.04, as long as my wage is not uh, <laughs> influenced by that. If I got raised every year, that's okay by me. So, we think about that. We think about what is like uh, uh, consumptions, why people, uh, discussion about uh, there is a slowing down uh, demand, uh, is it by choice or is it by given that there is a decrease in the, in the waste? That's the issue, I think. Uh, issue also on, on, on the productivity. We don't know the cause, uh, many, that, uh, many things that we don't know, and we might need to uh, wait until the data comes. Uh, in this case, the government need to catch up with the big data, given that like survey data, like, like uh, manufacturing, uh, is like about two years. So we got explanations from this uh, year issues, maybe uh, next two years. I'm sorry for uh, uh, the one that uh, wants to answer right away. Uh, we cannot answer if there is not uh, quite a complete data of that. And also on the fiscal policy, uh, despite the risk of tax revenue collection below the target, I think uh, we can still optimize the, the policy in terms of the quality of spending, disbursement of spending still an issue in this uh, uh, central government budget and especially also at the local level. So we can, uh, uh, we can actually improve in that sense. And central government can influence local government. We have like in the budget for the intergovernmental transfer is about 40%, more than 40%, I think, with the, with the village level. So that's also the instrument that can be used by the central government, but still need to preserve the discretion of uh, local and provincial government. As also said, we are the lucky, lucky one as well with the positive growth of uh, 5% and export reserves uh, 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 increase and so keep the economy open. Uh, I think it works to drive the growth as well. But uh, we need also to, uh, to know about the characteristic of the economy like the export. Most of the export is because I'm not of uh, a trade economist, so I just pick up uh, uh, these pictures from uh, uh, the Atlas one. So if you, if you say this is the condition of export composition of sector in 95 and 2015, not much change of colors mean activity of uh, economic sectors that does not evolve well. So mostly on, uh, still on commodity, uh, and there is also an industry, light industry, and the industry itself related also to domestic demand. And here, exporting form is supported by imports. The color is the same, import and uh, uh, export. So, like the, uh, even commodity like petroleum, we, ha we export and we also import. So global economy and micro uh, stability matters and Indonesia uh, now is have uh, uh, quite a sustainable micro stability. And here on business climate, the challenge is quite different if we uh, compare between small enterprise and medium and large enterprise. We classify here, this is from the survey by LPM 2016, last November, last year, 
we classify a small enterprise for the firms that have sales or revenue uh, below 2.5 billion uh, rupiah. Medium is 2.5 until 50 uh, billion rupiah and large is more than 50. So for the medium and large enterprise, it's more the issue of global economic uh, condition. Uh, so if uh, slowing demand, they might also, both of them is, uh, why is uh, structural reform also important? Government policy uncertainty is also become uh, issue both by medium and large as well as micro and small enterprise. But the different one is, uh, for the micro and small enterprise, the first issue is the monopoly practice. They cannot access, they don't have the same maybe level of playing field here and also corruptions. That's why maybe uh, as discussed previously, we need to tackling the corruptions at the local level on licensings and others uh, instruments that are used by politicians, but we cannot expect politicians to be benevolent. Politicians is serve interest as well as other parties. So what we need to do is like uh, for the central government uh, reform, uh, it's not a marching orders. Uh, not all reform need to be cut, catered in all regions. It depends on the type of the initiative and also like uh, related to business climate improvement can be done by uh, main, uh, uh, we need to focus on, on corruption. And uh, on the centralization is not always bad given that even uh, for the poor province, lower per capita GDP province, they have high economic growth. And uh, if they have high economic growth, we can expect that might, might, might be poverty will decrease as well. So there is a, a relationship between growth and reduction in poverty. Thank you. Uh, thank you. A friend and colleagues, uh, Raden start his uh, uh, presentation by asking whether 5% is a normal growth for Indonesia. Uh, two issues with that, two main issues with that. One is that do nothing, do not guarantee that Indonesia will be having the 5% given the weakening trend of uh, demand. And the other thing is that 5% might not enough to absorb uh, the increasing labor coming in, into the market. It might not enough to reduce poverty. It might not enough for reducing unemployment and it might not sustain the environment that Indonesia currently have. So with that, I would like to open the uh, Q&A. Uh, one over there, uh, please give it to uh, Howard. And uh, one over there, uh, please give it. Yeah, Howard. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you, uh, Paradin. I only get one question, so let me ask about your very interesting figures on online shopping. Uh, the thought occurs to me, if you live in a very congested city like Jakarta, it makes a lot of sense to move the logistics problem from the household to the supplier. So my question is, do you have any disaggregated data which would say how much of the online shopping is a Jakarta phenomenon as opposed to the rest of Java or the rest of Indonesia? Thank you. Uh, gentleman over there. Paraden, thanks for the uh, lovely presentation. My name is Irwan Sinaga. I have 250 questions. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, just like that of the political update, I, you haven't seen, you know, you haven't touched a little bit about the uh, economic update on foreign policy. Uh, would you please enlighten us a little bit on your opinion about this uh, economic update on foreign policy, economic foreign policy update? Secondly, um, while many countries now towards protectionism, including Indonesia to some extent, but Indonesia is now involving in many uh, economic liberalizations like TPP, RCEP, 
comprehensive economic partnership with some European Union countries, Japan, Korea, including Australia. Do you, what do you think about that, Pak? Do you have any opinion about that? Thank you. Uh, Hal Hill? Yeah, uh, uh, right in. Truman Cassie Banyak, uh, Hal Hill. Really enjoyed your presentation. Just on room to move for the government, uh, if you're saying that the fiscal <laughs> room to move is very limited because of the fiscal law, uh, and structural reform is going to be difficult the next two years because coming up election. towards an election, what's left? I mean, the one thing which maybe is left is the exchange rate a bit, isn't it? I mean, you can let the exchange rate go a bit more. Now, it's true Bank Indonesia is, not, is now intervening less than it used to, but you could imagine a scenario where the exchange rate, you could let it go a little bit. I know you have to worry about it because after the, you know, the Chris Mon, you're still, it's a sensitive issue, but maybe you could let it go a bit more, couldn't you? I mean, it's not the best solution. The best solution is the structural reform you talked about, but maybe that's one possibility, especially if you think the Fed and the ECB are going to start sort of tightening a bit more, and maybe you, you'll get a natural sort of adjustment through that mechanism. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Howard, uh, it's online shopping, it is true that online shopping, it is the phenomena in the urban area right now. We haven't seen the numbers in the rural, of course, because at the same time, I think uh, we have an infrastructure problem as well. If you uh, try to have the online shopping up to the rural area. So it is true, this is uh, uh, mostly uh, urban, especially Jakarta and uh, Java uh, phenomena. Uh, but Sinaga, I, I think the economic update of foreign policy, uh, foreign policy is foreign policy, economic <laughs> update, uh, I mean, uh, certainly now we are not interested to, I mean, it's correct if, if, if I'm wrong, uh, Ibu Mari, uh, not interesting to negotiate in the international trade recently. We don't, we don't see Indonesia is very active on this arena right now, of course. Because again, at the same time, all the countries not really interesting to discuss about this one. Yeah. Not many countries, probably, uh, including, of course, the, the, the US. So uh, this has not become uh, a priority. Somehow, at the same time, as I mentioned before, we have so many things to do, right? So I don't think this is the priority now for the government. Well, uh, at the same time, right now, the Ministry of Trade is priority just to control the price of rice, right? <laughs> Hall, I, I agree with you on these ones. Uh, in fact, we have uh, a monograph together with Gus Papanek on these ones, which is we try to use exchange rate policy uh, as, a, as, a, as a policy in order to induce our export, basically. At the same time, I, I still see basically uh, a potential if we can shifting our focus on the export side. Why is that? Uh, recently, we follow the numbers that uh, the export for garment and sporting goods is increasing rapidly. And it is back from Vietnam. I think the Vietnam kind of already uh, saturated, and that back again to Indonesia. And we make some exercise on these ones. If we can just have additional 30 billion uh, export from labor intensive like shoes, garment, and textile, the impact to the uh, GDP growth but how, is around 1.4%. It's very significant. So this is another, uh, uh, but since I don't have time to discuss this and just focus on uh, so many issues, but, but it is true. We have a chance to do this one again, and that's precisely that we are left. Again, our manufacturing policy in 1970, 1985, right? And until 1995, this is, this is the high time for manufacturing sector, which is growing by more than, I think the, the manufacturing is close to 10%, and uh, manufacturing export is almost 15% at the time. And job creation in this sector also is growing very fast during the time. And probably this is one of the explanations again why our 
uh, GDP growth also in terms of sector also uh, <coughs> declining recently. Uh, Riyadu, you, you want to respond as well? Uh. You don't have to. We can, we can have another round of questions. I uh, would like to allow the lady over there. Uh, thank you very much. But, uh, it's uh, very could interesting. you mention who you are? Uh, my name is Kali Yuan from DFAT. Um, I'm interested in your different views about decentralization. Um, it's uh, pretty clear that Indonesia has some very dynamic cities, very dynamic regions, um, econo economically speaking. Um, is decentralization such a bad thing when if you need to apply structural reforms, the biggest bang for buck is to target your most dynamic cities and regions? Um, yeah, interested in your different views. Uh, thank you. My name is Yogi Fidatama from uh, University of Canberra. Uh, my question is mostly to Pa Raden, but also uh, to Ibu Riyatu. Uh, you complained about the un, uh, uncoordinated economic policy due to decentralization uh, is based on this uh, unclear coalition. But the question is, uh, how much do you think the economic policy of the head of the uh, uh, region as well as the local parliament actually in line with the party line. Thanks. Uh, I would like to give the uh, chance for two more, Cameron and there is a lady over there. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Cameron Noble from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Uh, thank you to both speakers. I have my questions to both of you. Um, but Radin, in your presentation, you um, you talked about the difficulty of of, of uh, structural reform, of uh, having a common vision of coordination and things like that. And you alluded to a possible solution, but it wasn't said clearly. I was wondering if you could just give us a, a clear uh, answer on what you think is the answer to those kind of challenges that that Indonesia is challenging is, is facing now. Thank you. Uh, the lady over there, yeah. please mention your name. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Lally, and my question basically is um, related to the economic growth um, that is being used to measure um, Indonesia. Does economic growth actually also cool. man, uh, measure? the cost of economic growth, like for example, social inequality and the cost to environment and um, also corruptions, isn't it? Why we are so worried about the declining of economic growth instead of the cost of economic growth? Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, what's the first question is decentralization. Is betting for structure? Is betting? Or is betting or not? Uh, I don't say. Uh, again, I agree with Riato that decentralization is I have to take it as a given. But uh, the problem is how to make it more effective. I think this is also uh, related to the, 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 the third question is, what can we do? How to make it more uh, effective? Uh, I think uh, if you're asking me how to make it more effective, there are many things that we can do. First of all, I think I have to admit among the central uh, government bureaucracy, among the policymakers, They are policy making uh, is still saving by a central government, as if this is a centralized government. So in, in most cases, we don't really discuss the policy with the governor and with the Bupatis as well. So I think uh, this is one of the the the, the, the different probably and when 
like I show you the numbers of uh, initiative, 16 initiatives, 16 policy packets, and could be only is a matter of week. There is another policy at the time. How can you have time to discuss these ones to the local government? I think so. The approach of policymakers should be different. I think. So. And second, of course, as I mentioned before, three at most, probably two to three packets is enough. And make sure that uh, this is implemented uh, correctly. And number three, uh, this is again, uh, we need to have some kind of incentive mechanism. Uh, I tried to talk to some of the uh, Bupatis, the head of the district, and they say, uh, do you know this policy? Do you know this national policy? They say, what is in it for me? I mean, <laughs> of course, I agree with Riatu. They only know the program if it, if it is related to the budget. But other than that, they don't really care, right? Because it is not affected their performance as well. So they care is only if you provide incentive. So in line with the national policy, for example, for reform, then you provide incentive to them. Tie it with, for example, uh, fiscal policy. Then it could be different. But if you just asking them to do something without reward, it's nothing happened. Because again, as I mentioned to you before, is the constraint number two is basically they have to maximize their own interest first. And at the same time, they have their own promise. They have their own program to their constituents. So the change of uh, what is the, we, we need to make some change as well in the central government. And uh, again, the incentive mechanism is a missing link somehow right now in Indonesia. Again, in terms of a quali uh, Yugi, about uh, it is true somehow, although I, I, I mentioned about we have not have a very clear coalition. But anyway, in Indonesia, it's a very fluid coalition in a sense, right? Because at the end, when you nominated the party candidates, for example, for governor of West Java, yeah? Uh, it's not clear. Right? At the end, there is a transaction across party there. And that's, that's precisely the problem. So again, at the end, the governor or the Pupatis that elected by the party, first thing first, they maximize his own interest. Probably it's not the party. And even the party leaders, is, you can satisfy them with transfer self of the benefit that you get. That's, that's the problem uh, precisely that, uh, I, mean, I mean, it is it's quite remarkable. I, I, I make some interview according to the high ranking of public goods procurement agency in Jakarta and one of the current major in Jakarta. I interview these two guys. According to them, the former governor of Jakarta is Ahok. Disliked by many private suppliers and contractors, local legislators, and bureaucracy. Why is that? Because he has done the right things, according to him, according to both of them, which is reduce the possibility of corruption within the, his government by his discipline using e-catalog procurement in the system for public goods procurement in Jakarta. But at the same time, he can cut budget, his budget, up to 30%, and yet he deliver his public service quite efficiently. So this is another thing, probably. If we can cut these ones, another 30% that we can spend to the economy. I think I will stop there. It's too bad. Uh, Riyadu? Yeah. Uh, I think for the structural reform, yes, we need to involve the local and provincial government 
uh, especially as uh, the policy also related to them on business climate, it is uh, related on licensing, licensing at the local level and provincial level is also an, an issue, especially as shown by the survey also uh, uh, for the small and micro enterprise. You can bribe by the <laughs> Uh, for the large and medium, but but small and 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 uh, uh, micro, they might get uh, uh, the burden more. Uh, and yes, there is also an issue. The incentive is not quite established, as we know that the local tax is only 12 percent of the overall government revenue. And in terms of non-tax, like license uh, chargers and and others, like uh, we call it uh, PNBP. Uh, in comparison to, to local and provincial tax, local and provincial tax is less than 5%. So you, we are talking about 95% of uh, total revenue by the central governments. So even if there are infrastructures at the regions, they are uh, a, simplify, uh, uh, a simplified system of, of administration. It's not quite clear what the gov uh, that local or provincial government can. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, friend and colleague, uh, we uh, come to the end of this session, and we, although we know that uh, Indonesian uh, effort to sustain 5% growth or even trying to make better is still very challenging, and we also know that it's not only about choosing the right policy, but also being able to implement, uh, implement them. And we also know that uh, political structure matters in determining what kind of policy to be implemented, can be implemented. So before I end this uh, session, let me uh, announce uh, several, uh, 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 several things. Once, uh, one is that lunch breakout will run until 1 p.m., so we expect that um, all of you uh, will come back at 1 p.m. Uh, for all update speaker and chair, lunch will be provided in seminar room B of this building. Uh, and uh, for members of the audience, there are various cafe across campus and nearby New Acton that offer a great lunch. If you need any suggestion, please come ask one of our volunteers. And for Friday uh, prayer arrangement, for those interested in attending Friday prayer, there will be a volunteer, Rusran Nasruddin, waiting at the front entrance of the Kum Building Theater after this session to take you to the prayer room. And uh, we really hope that you can come back uh, in time at 1 p.m. because we are going to uh, start the next session uh, sharp at that time. And for now, please uh, join me to thank the two uh, presenters.